Continuing Education knows that at the end, students want to graduate and we can help them do that because we take the time to really listen to their needs and we understand all the different options that are available across the campus for them. We don't take a cookie cutter approach. We realize each student comes with their own story. So whether it's a part-time student looking to complete a degree program or someone just looking for online courses, we're there to connect them to the resources of the university. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's CWA. I'm Kylie McKee. I'll be the moderator. Um, I'm a CU graduate. I graduated in 2019, International Affairs, and then I got my master's at University of Denver. Um, I'm currently working at University of Denver for a research institute, and I'm happy to be back here uh, moderating a panel. Um, so today is Thursday, April 11th, 2024. It is 10.30 a.m., and this panel is 17998. Uh, titled Democratic Backsliding, The Rise of Authoritarianism and Autocracy. I hope you, hopefully you're at the right panel. Um, it's not gonna be all doom and gloom like apocalypse now, but it still will hopefully be some eye-opening for y'all. Um, so before we get started, the University of Colorado Boulder, Colorado's flagship university, honors and recognizes the many contributions of indigenous peoples in our state. CU Boulder acknowledges that it is located on the traditional territories and ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, and many other Native American nations. Their forced removal from these territories, territories has caused devastating and lasting impacts. While the University of Colorado Boulder can never undo or rectify the devastation wrought on indigenous peoples, we commit to improving and enhancing engagement with indigenous peoples and in issues locally and globally. We will do this by recognizing and amplifying the voices of indigenous CU Boulder students, staff, and faculty and their work, um, educating, conducting research, supporting student success, and integrating indigenous knowledge, um, and consulting, engaging, and working with colla collaboratively with tribal nations to enhance our ability to, pro to provide access and culturally sensitive support and to recruit, retain, and graduate Native American students in a climate that is inclusive and respectful. Um, one other thing I'd like to mention, as you've probably assumed from other panels, we are doing the Q&A through um, index cards. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. We have producers located around, um, and they will bring you a card. If you are a student, please notify that on the card. I will prioritize your questions first. Um, and now I'd like to do a brief introduction of our panelists. Um, for more information, you can find them on the CWA website. Um, so to my direct left, we have Rachel Sigmund. She's an assistant professor at the, of democratic government at the jo Joseph Corbell School of International Studies at University of Denver. Um, she is also a project man manager at Varieties of Dem Democracy, also known as VDEM. Um, it's a unique approach to measuring, conceptualizing, and visualizing democracy around the world. Um, and I have the pleasure to work with her on a project as well um, at DU. Um, to her left, we have Hadar Harris. Oops, sorry. She is an award-winning international human rights attorney who brings a comparative perspective across sectoral work. Um, she's currently the interim director at PEN America, a nonprofit organization gearing towards protecting freedom of expression in the US and worldwide. Um, and then to the left of her, we have John Hefferman, a good friend. She is, uh, he is the president of the Foundation for Systemic Change, an organization that provides flexible grant funding to support engagement projects that highlight ongoing economic, political, social, racial, and ethnic inequities. Um, and he has over 30 years of experience in leadership roles across the international uh, sphere. Joe Cerencioni on our last, on the end, last but not least, he is our national security analyst who's on the t one of the top experts in the field who's dedicated his career towards nuclear nonproliferation, um, and he's also served as a president of the Plowshare Fund, a public grant-making foundation focused on nonproliferation and conflict resolution. He's also a fan favorite of CWA. This is probably his sixth plus CWA, um, and we're <laughs> glad to have him back. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome, so to get this started, um, yeah. we've seen democratic backsliding going all around the world. Um, it's not confined to any particular region, it bleeds across nations. Um, so the first question I have is while you, with your introductions is what's your take on democratic backsliding? And we'll start with Rachel. Thank you so much, Kylie, for that kind introduction and thanks to the entire CWA team and all of you for being here. Uh, I'm truly honored to be included among such distinguished speakers and especially my co-panelists here. Uh, I moved to the Front Range about a year and a half ago 
uh, along with the rest of the world, pretty much. Um, and this is, I think, the fifth time I've been invited to speak on democratic backsliding in the region. And so it's just wonderful to be in a state and a, and a region that is really engaged with these issues. And I think the world has a lot to learn from Colorado in terms of um, being a place where people from all over can come and participate and be involved civically. So, pleasure to be here. Um, so as Kylie mentioned, one of the things I do in my professor role is I'm involved with a project called the Varieties of Democracy, or VDEM project. VDEM is, um, uh, produces basically the largest and arguably the most rigorous uh, data set on democracy in the world. Uh, it collects data on political systems and practices uh, of just about every country from over 4,200 country experts who are located in 185 different countries. Um, and so the data are used widely in academic work, in international organizations, in policy uh, uh, discussions, as well as among activists and civil society organizations. And so what I'd like to do is just focus a few minutes on what these data are telling us about the state of democracy in the world today, um, and specifically what we're seeing in terms of democratic backsliding. Um, so first of all, if we think of democracy as the combination of contested elections, and by contested I mean we don't actually know who's going to win the election beforehand, um, meaningful popular participation in those elections, the protection of civil rights and freedoms so that people really truly can meaningfully participate, um, and some kind of constraints on executive power. So those, you know, we can think of those maybe as the core features. Uh, so if we measure democracy along those lines, uh, the global average democracy score across countries has declined by about 5% from its highest point ever in 2011 and 2012. So that's, um, that's as of 20, the end of 2023, according to the VDEM data. So there's a decline, but not, a, not an extremely steep decline. However, if we look at the share of the world's population that is living in autocratic countries, it has increased from around 48% in 2013 to around 70% in 2020, 71% in 2023. So that's 5.8 billion people living in autocracies currently. Um, additionally, approximately 35% of the world's population live in 42 countries that have been experiencing some form of deterioration in their democratic qualities. Um, and so a lot of the, the concern here um, is that uh, you know, larger countries, more populous countries, countries that contain large percentages of the world's population are disproportionately seeing these trends in democratic backsliding. By contrast, only 5% of the population are located in countries in which democracy has been observed to be improving to some extent. Um, okay, and so in terms of which democratic attributes at risk, the VDEM data collects data on like something like 600 different attributes of democracy. Uh, freedom of, of expression, and especially the media environment, has been the most uh, under threat. We've seen the most decline in that area. We've also seen attacks on freedom of association and the environment for civil society activity. And more recently, we've seen more, precip more precipitous declines in the quality of elections. So that's all the bad news. Um, let me briefly conclude with some historical perspective that I think warrants a little bit more optimism. So first of all, the world is still way more democratic than it was 100 years ago. Uh, in the long sort of arc of history, way more people are living in societies where they do enjoy some rights and freedoms, they can participate in their governing systems, and where the rule of law is, at least to some extent, respected. Um, if we look back in history at various periods of democratic backsliding since 1900, um, about half of the episodes of democratic backsliding um, over this long period of time uh, were actually reversed or turned around. So there is uh, evidence of democratic resilience and we're learning more about these instances in which democracies maybe are under attack, are under threat, but then we see sort of a U-turn. Um, and so part of that is that we're starting to understand what makes democracy more resilient, 
Um, and that the, the most sort of important features that are coming out of those, uh, those <coughs> stories um, are strong and independent judicial institutions and really vigorous mobilization by the population and by civil society. Um, so you can infer sort of what maybe needs to happen in the US or elsewhere um, in, order to, uh, in order to build a more sort of robust um, uh, protection of democracy uh, for the future. So I'll leave it there. I'm really excited to hear what my co-panelists have to say and uh, to engage in this discussion. Thank you. Welcome to the happy panel. <laughs> it, it is either heartening or it is frightening to see so many people in the audience for this uh, session. Um, but as, as Rachel said, you know, the, the level of engagement and the fact that people do want to hear and learn and understand what's happening in terms of democratic backsliding, both in this country and around the world, um, is important because the role that we each play in stemming that tide is incredibly important. So I also want to thank the organizers for inviting. This is an amazing conference. This is my first time here. This is my second day in, and I'm all in. Um, you know, I am here, uh, you know, I, I work currently uh, with PEN America, which is an organization that works on freedom of expression and the intersection of literature and human rights. But I'm here on this panel um, as an international human rights attorney who has worked for many years about, uh, on issues of how to combine or to implement these ideas of human rights and um, how we understand and implement them here in the United States. So I'm gonna spend a minute talking about democratic backsliding here in the United States, something that a few of you might be familiar with. Um, you know, as we talk about democratic backsliding, the whole premise of that idea of backsliding kind of presupposes that democracy is already good or that we're solid in what democracy is. And I appreciate Rachel laying out a variety of factors that we can look to to try to measure what democracy is as it functions. Right? And there are lots of other measures as well that people have tried, whether it is Freedom House, whether it is VDEM, whether it is um, the World Justice Project and a variety of others who try to kind of measure indicators of the health of democracy and freedom in the world. All of them have kind of similar indicators, but many of them are different and it speaks to the fact that democracy is different in different parts of the world. Our understanding of what rule of law is is different in different parts of the world. So I just wanna start by kind of saying that, that our democracy in the United States has never been well established or secure. Mm -hmm. We saw just a few years ago and we see it very vibrantly today um, in terms of how at risk our democracy actually is. And our democracy is built on that social contract that we all learned about in ninth grade, you know, US history or, or world philosophy or, or I don't remember what class it was, for God's sake. Eighth you know, grade. it was eighth grade. Well, you were always ahead of me. So, um, uh, you know, in terms of what a social contract is and how democracy actually is formed, understood, and integrated into our society. What we see is a fraying of that, a fraying of that understanding, and active attacks and undermining of that agreement between people and government, and understanding, you know, uh, and citizens' understanding of what their role in a democracy actually is. We can talk about that in a few minutes. We can talk about that as we understand kind of how to get out of where we are right now and how to better perfect the democracy that we hope to have in this country or that many of us hope to have in this country. But I wanna just give you a couple more, more, well, actually, I don't need to go through all of the different factors because Rachel kind of laid out a lot of them. Sorry. But no, 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 that, it was great. But what I do wanna point to is the fact that how many of you, well, no, because I've already kind of, kind of, you know, um, biased the group by saying like we don't have a perfect democracy. But I will tell you the World Justice Project, which is an organization that measures the health of rule of law around the world, 
has recently come out with their most recent numbers and assessments of 146 country, 142 countries around the world. See, I would normally say, okay, how many of you think that the U.S. is in the bottom 50%? And all of you would, you know, raise your hand because I've just given you this information, but that's not true. Good news is we're not in the bottom 50%, but we're also not in the top 10. So the United States is, uh, is uh, overall uh, ranked, uh-oh, overall ranked 28th out of 142 countries in terms of the health of our um, democracy and commitment to rule of law. And there are a number of different factors that include the four that Rachel laid out and a few more in terms of peaceful transfer of power, in terms of accountability for government officials, in terms of those kinds of things that actually push our score down. We should be worried about that. We should be vigilant about that. And we can talk in a few minutes about things that we should be watching for and things that we can actually do as citizens or residents in this country um, to help stem this tide. So with that, I'll turn it over to John. Thanks. Thanks, Dar. <laughs> well, welcome, everybody. It's, it's really a joy for me to be here. This is my third year. Joe, you have beat, you've beat me by three years. But I love coming here and look forward to it. Every, every year. And I also love the titles that you all, who, who does somebody sort of sit in a <laughs> room somewhere and come up with these titles? It's a, it'd be a great job. I want to be part of that. Um, Kylie, thank you for the introduction. I, I appreciate it. I, um, I, I, I think it's important to talk about, about democracy as a form of government. Is it the best thing? Is it, you know, is this, is there anything else that's better? I can't think of anything, anything right now, but clearly there probably is a lot of improvement that can be made, and I'll give you an example. I used to work for an organization called National Democratic Institute for International Affairs, NDI, and they work all over the world bringing democracy. Initially, it was after 1989, sort of burgeoning democratic societies. How do you do it? How do you create a, a democratic legislature? How do you create a, de a democratic judiciary, civil society? Um, I worked, I was the chief of party, I love that title, um, in, in Guyana, South America, right? And um, so we, we did all of that, and, and, and including free and fair elections in Guyana. The primary issue that's led to, to so much um, strife is, is, is an ethnic one. You have uh, um, Afro-Guyanese that came over as slaves to work for the British colonialists who uh, rebelled early um, prior to our Civil War, and then they needed people to work in, 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 in the, in the uh, sugar fields and the, and the rice fields, and so they brought in Indo-Guyanese who were indentured servants. So you had this, this tension that's been going on for, for hundreds of years in Guyana, and the U.S. government and a lot of other governments poured hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in, into Guyana to make it more democratic, including free and fair elections. But people voted along ethnic lines. So you had an election that was deemed free and fair. Jimmy Park Carter came down and on the tarmac the day before the election said, the election is free and fair. But you had people voting, if you were Indo-Guyanese, you voted with the Indo-Guyanese candidate, and if you were Afro-Guyanese, you voted for the Afro-Guyanese. So what it did is it perpetuated this ethnic divide. So I'm just saying this is an example where perhaps, you know, we ought to think about the role that democracy can play, play in not always supporting the right thing for people. I, um, I, I'm, when I thought about what I wanted to say here, I just thought, what does it say in our country in terms of backsliding when the president of another country comes to visit here and, vi and, and visits our former president and the Heritage Foundation? And this is what Viktor Orban, the president of, of Hungary, did. What does that say? What does it say when, when you think about, when I think about how we had this small window of, of, of democracy flourishing throughout, throughout this country post-1989 
and you think about prior to that, you know, autocratic dictatorships in, in, in Latin and South America, and you think about what was happening, obviously, in the Soviet Union and other places. And then we had this rise of democracy, right? And we had this for maybe 10, 15 years. And now, look what's happening. And look what's happening in this country. And one of the issues that I want to talk about, and we'll have hopefully more time to talk about, in terms of looking at the greatest threat to democracy in this country, and Hardar is going to laugh because I, we talk about this all the time. But for me, it's what's happening in our education system right now. And what's happening vis-a-vis -vis, um, legal measures being passed in states, some, and you probably have the figure, Hadar, 200, 200 um, statewide policies have passed in the last two years restricting what educators, and I use that term to include librarians and others, what they can and cannot teach. And to me, this is a real threat to, to our democracy. And so what we've done in DC, we've formed this organization called the, the, the Right to Learn Coalition, bringing together human rights organizations. And this is a human rights issue. This is about the threat. This is about the violation of, of this is about um, the right to education. This is about the right to the child. This is about blatant discrimination. And when you look, about, look at what's happening in this, this country and compare it to what was happening in 1935 Germany and compare it to what's happening in 1990 Bosnia and 19, these are all places that, well, not Germany, but um, that I've worked in um, and, and Rwanda and what happened in terms of these early warning signs that we see in this country in terms of the propaganda, in terms of, in terms of scapegoating, in terms of past group violence. Look what happened in, 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 in um, in, uh, at the University of, of Virginia a few years ago. Armed conflict, and I put January 6th under that category. And you look at, at the preparations being made, if anybody's had, had um, an opportunity to read the latest report coming out of the Her Heritage Foundation that essentially is, is a guidebook for, for Donald Trump's uh, administration where, in fact, one of the hallmarks of this report is talking about completely eliminating the role of, of, of um, civil servants in our country and making them political appointees so that, in fact, they can all be fired and that they can put in people that are, are of the same persuasion as, as, uh, as Donald Trump. So I just give those as, as you know, few examples about Democrats uh, backsliding in this country, but I do think that education is one that we really, really need to be concerned about because it's organized, it's well-funded, and it's having an impact. Project 2025 is what it Yeah, Project 2025 Heritage Foundation. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. I came in late, so I have uh, 15 minutes for my opening remarks. Yeah. Is that <laughs> <laughs> I, I just checked my iPhone, and my first photo from the Conference on World Affairs is from 2009. So I've been coming with a COVID break of a few years. This is my 11th uh, conference, and one of the reasons I keep coming back is because I get to be on panels with experts like, like these guys who really know their stuff, who really bring you know, decades of experience and, and uh, academic integrity to their analysis, which I don't on democracy. <laughs> <laughs> so I get to just tell you what I think. And, uh, as President Joe Biden says, I've been around for a while. <laughs> I've seen a few things. And there have been many times in my life where I thought that we were in the midst of a crisis that had profound implications for the governance of our country and for the maintenance of the global international order that the United States created at the end of World War II. I felt that way about the Vietnam War. I felt that way about the arms race in the 1980s when Ronald Reagan and Leonid Brezhnev brought the world close to nuclear war. I felt that way with the Iraq war, which I thought was the worst foreign policy national security blunder any president had ever made. But this, this is worse. This is worse. The, the global threat to, to democracy, it, in my, view is more profound, more serious now than, it, than, it, than it's been at any time since perhaps this, the, the Civil War and the immediate aftermath. Uh, and the reason is, is twofold. One is that it's a global phenomenon. Authoritarian regimes have consolidated power in uh, m 
some of the most populous and largest countries in the world, Russia, China, India. They are joined by uh, uh, autocratic leaders with, who are developing their own playbook in other countries like, um, like Hungary or some of the Central American countries or some of the South American countries that go back and forth on this. I consider Putin's regime in Russia a fascist country. I don't know any other word for it, and I, I think it's time we have to bring, we haven't mentioned that word on the panel yet, but I think it's, it's time to be talking about a, a, th a rising threat of fascism similar to that that we experienced in the 1930s, and that's because it's coupled with the other threat, which is we have in our own country a rising authoritarian, again, I would call it fascist movement growing within inside our own country. This is not the first time we've seen these kinds of, of movements. The 1930s, n the Nazi party had you know, major rallies at Madison Square Garden. There were authoritarian figures of various kinds that rose to power, threatened the, the established order, cooperated with the, the Nazi regime in Germany to try to overthrow American democracy. They failed. One of the reasons they failed is that they had never were able to uh, m uh, emerge from a, a sort of a third party or fringe status. This time, it's different. This time, the authoritarian movement has seized control of one of the two major parties in America. The, 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 the Republican Party has become an authoritarian party. I wouldn't say the whole party is fascist, but there are certainly fascist elements in that party that have all the earmarks, anybody who's read Timothy Snyder knows what I'm talking about, uh, of the use of violence to obtain or keep power, the spread of dif disinformation, an, 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 a, an hostility to democratic institutions, a refusal to recognize the results of elections. And what worries me most of all is that this authoritarian movement has been embraced by a significant sector of the capitalist class, mm -hmm. by the people who run our industries, our economy, have an enormous influence over our government. Maybe you've seen the New York, recent New York Times article on how uh, le leading capitalists who rejected Donald Trump after January 6th have come back to him. Why have they come back to him? because they favor reductions in their taxes, because they want less regulation, that they, they favor the policies that he's going to advance that they believe will increase their wealth. And maybe you've seen uh, some of the reviews of a recent book out documenting the rise of Hitler in 1932, a critical period. For me, we're at 1932. We're at a period where the authoritarian leader is not yet consolidated power, most people don't actually think that he can do this. Those people, like the, the leaders of, of these, these industries who have embraced Trump, think that they can control him, just as the German capitalists thought they could control Hitler, that they think the greater threat comes from the left, not from the right, that they can use Trump for their own purposes. They are fundamentally and dangerously wrong. And the reason is that this time, they're not, Trump is not fooling around. He has a plan. This isn't 2016. This isn't January 6th. They have a plan they have learned. If Trump is elected like Hitler was elected, like Mussolini was elected, like Putin was elected, fascists rise to power through elections primarily. If he is elected, he is gonna use the democratic system to dismantle the democratic system. It's clear he has a plan. There's two aspects to this. One, there are not gonna be any guardrails. You remember how people felt when he was elected in 2016 and said, well, look, he's a sociopath suffering from malignant uh, narcissism and has no government experience, but he's gonna be surrounded by senior people who will protect us. And in some ways, they did. Most of those senior people now, by the way, completely reject Trump and warn against his reelection. But they are not gonna be there in 2025. If he takes the oath of office in 2025, he's going to put sycophants in as Secretary of State, as Attorney General, as the Joint Chief, head of the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. They are going to run from the top down, 
they're going to put in, in positions of power people whose fundamental loyalty is not to the Constitution, no matter what they say when they take the oath of office, but is to the leader, to Donald Trump. But it's worse than that. Project 2025 should become essential reading for everybody in this room. Just look it up. This is a thousand page document that details how they're gonna dismantle the democratic system in America. They're gonna fire civil servants. They're gonna make sure that, that, that there are no, that the regulatory agencies that protect consumers, that apply for health and social, uh, health standards, safety standards are eliminated. They're gonna purge the government and replace them with apparatchiks. Where did they get this idea? Viktor Orban, that's what he did. Adolf Hitler, that's what he did. I, it's not hyperbole to compare what they're doing now to what Hitler did in 1932. That's the kind of way we have to start thinking about this and why this election, no kidding, is the most important election of our time. If we don't defeat Donald Trump, we may never have another election in this country again, at least not a contested election. Thank you. Yes. Does anybody have any follow-up on anybody that somebody has said? If not, I do have some questions as well prepared. Everything, everything the user said. I, I think just one thing to note is that um, there are 64 elections taking place in 2024 around the world. That means 49% of the world's population is undergoing elections right now. So as Rachel talks about, you know, the, the significant backsliding in large populations who have, have democratic uh, structures in place, know that all of those, many, many, many of those are in the midst of election seasons right now, not just us in the United States. Um, I 100% concur that Project 2025 needs to be essential reading for everybody. Um, don't read it at night before you go to bed because you <laughs> might not go to sleep. Um, you know, read it with a glass of wine or, or take a Valium before you read it. Um, <laughs> You know, but, but it should be the thing that should be motivating people in a very, very significant way. Um, and, it, and I guess the last point that I would make is that there is a through line, that was in my notes somewhere here, there's a through line from what is happening around the world with the Orbans in the world um, and what is happening in this country. There is an authoritarian playbook that is playing out quite vividly. We saw it in 2017 and as an international human rights attorney who has lived and worked all over the world on these issues of democracy like John and done election observation and, and really helped to try to promote rule of law in transitional countries in that post-1989 period, right? We saw it so vividly from the very beginning of Trump's campaign through the, uh, through the inauguration and everything that he tried to do and in this campaign where we see very systematically the pieces putting in pl being put in place um, that, that don't only refer to kind of the, the way that the structures of the Republican Party are being compromised, but also in terms of the things that are happening on the local and state levels to restrict the right to protest to disenfranchise voters in a very significant way in almost every state, in the ways that the courts have been stacked. You know, we thought that, that the, the courts would save us in, in 2017. And in some ways they did, and in some ways, some of them might now, maybe, but, but we're already seeing the impact of judicial appointments and the ways in which that is manifesting in the way that our balance of powers is either working or not working in an increasing way. So, you know, all of these things are not just happening, mm. but a lot of these things are happening without you watching. And so this conversation is really important to at least open some eyes around some of the really systematic 
things that are happening and the fact that these are not surprises if you're watching. I'll just jump in here real quick. Um, completely agree with everything that's been said here. But I also want to uh, turn the tables a little bit and just note that a lot of the research on mobilization and activism emphasizes the need for people to feel a sense of efficacy. And as much as the, these alarmist type of you know, issues and, and things that are happening are very, very important to shed light on and bring to our attention, we have to balance that with stories about successes, even if they're very local, even if they're in far-flung corners of the world. I, a lot of my research focuses on Africa. Um, and so, for example, just, just in the last few weeks in Senegal, um, uh, one of right. Africa's strongest democracies uh, historically, which had been under threat over the last couple of years from a president who was trying to aggrandize his power. Um, we saw uh, the opposition mobilize, we saw people mobilize, and the president was defeated and there was a peaceful transfer of power. Same thing in Malawi. Uh, we've seen um, you know, a country that has none of the sort of prerequisites you would expect to have a, a fairly robust democracy. Um, and we've seen uh, sort of an amazing sort of sequence of elections there. So I just wanna um, kind of give a plea to also think about the positive things that are going on. I think right here in Colorado, we also have some examples, not least of which was the Colorado Supreme Court decision. Um, regarding the Insurrection Act. And so, um, and especially for young people, I think, who maybe are losing faith in democracy as a form of government and in US institutions or other democratic institutions across the world, um, it's really important to not only, you know, think back to interwar Germany um, or, you know, what's going on in Hungary, but also to recognize sort of the positive developments around the world, um, both locally and globally. Thanks. Awesome. So we've got a lot of questions coming in, um, some of them more so domestic focused than others, but I'll try to get to all of them. Um, so one of the first ones is from a student, and I'm also going to combine it with another one. So one of these is a student, and then another one was, I am an old woman. So they're <laughs> asking, what can I do, pre preparing for this possibility of the rise of authoritarianism in the U.S. and then across the world, what can I do? Both at an older age and then also a younger age. And you already kind of touched on this a little bit. but yeah. um, Can I take a stab at that? Yeah. Did you already assign jump this? Or, oh, Go ahead. I can jump in. Well, it's, I think one of the things is, is sort of um, um, reiterating what, what Rachel said is there are a lot of organizations right now, civil society, um, small organizations and communities throughout, throughout the country that are, um, again, I, I've been focused on backsliding of education real large and how, how um, you know, there's a real concerted effort by, by the right to enter into communities and school boards and you know figure out who's going to run that will support uh, groups like Moms for Liberty and others that that you know are opposed to I think a lot of the things that are really really important for kids to learn just not critical race theory and and but but just critical thinking writ, writ large and all of that's on the chopping block but there are a lot of organizations that are fight we don't hear about them but even in Florida um, that and and. Adar can probably speak to this because uh, Penn has an operation in, in Florida um, that is, you know, in the business of, of highlighting those small organizations that are getting these tiny wins that will help. And I think, I think it's helpful for young people to realize that there are those people and organizations that are having having an impact out there. Um, it's hard when you're against, you know, uh, the media that that just focuses on you know, the laws that are being passed in places like Florida and other places, but uh, I think to herald those successes is, are, is very important. Can I just? Go ahead. Real quick, I began my life, uh, my career, I guess, as a uh, community organizer. So I believe that movements are built block by block. And in an age where we're all connected to the internet and can all do a social media response to something that the president says, we tend to forget that. So I'm a, you want to know what you can do? Give your money to people who are running against this authoritarian threat. Give your money to, to candidates who are advancing the cause that you believe in. Give your time to local organizations that are working on this. This is how the right has built their movement in this country. They've been doing it school board by school board, right? 
So we gotta fight them school board by school, city council by city council. This is where we have to, have to put our time, put our energy, um, put our, our creative thinking to work. It's local and then it becomes national. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we need to feel the impact and we need to feel the successes. We need to feel that on the most base level, right? And we need to be vigilant in our local communities, right? Yesterday, I talked about book bans. Yesterday, we talked about educational gag orders and censorship and inten intimidation bills, something that John and I like to talk about a lot, too much. Um, but, but, you know, and then last night, I got a message about a really terrible school board candidate in Montgomery County, Maryland. What? Who? Yeah, really, truly. That's, that's me. That's you. That's, you're the candidate? No, no, that's my Montgomery County. <laughs> <laughs> that was not your name. That was not your name. Sorry, Joe's out of town. <laughs> no, I'm in Montgomery County. So Montgomery go, tell County, me. So A, you know, I can't wait to have coffee with you when we get home. And B, um, yes, a, a, um, a really reactionary candidate who is running for the school board, who um, homeschools her six children, has a kind of fanatic agenda, um, and, you know, she won. because nobody, no, 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 the election's coming up in a few oh. weeks, um, and, and because nobody pays attention to school boards, um, there's mobilization wow. now around the bluest of blue, yes. Montgomery County, Maryland's school board race. But you know what? Mobilizing around the school board race also means mobilizing around other things. Just like you know, one one there there are lots of news uh, uh, coverage around how abortion bans may mobilize people in the general election, right? Because of consternation around limitations on the right to abortion. What's this going to mean in Arizona? As this ruling comes out the other day. All of that is big and up here, right? But if you have a kid that's going to college, boy or girl, and you're thinking about where they're gonna to go to college, and it's actually important to you that there is a right to contraception and a right to abortion, suddenly these big issues are actually very personal to you. And so, you know, the organizers say that, that you know, all politics are, are personal, or you know, all mm. politics are local. Mm. You know, Eleanor Roosevelt, in a very, very famous um, uh, phrase that, that human rights folks like to quote to, is said, human rights begin in small places close to home. That is also true with political engagement. That is also true with organizing. Um, you know, the, so, so success on the most local level and engagement on the most local level is a first step. Give your money, but also give your time. Right? How many yep. people wrote postcards to other districts to get the vote out, right? One of the problems is not just what's happening on the right, it's also disengagement from the left. It's also around young people who don't feel that, that elections actually you know, represent their views and they're just not gonna vote or they're gonna vote for a third party candidate mm. that's gonna splinter things that, that leads to, you know, which is a tactic and is part of the tactic as well. That, that lead down a bad road. So the problem is not only on the right, it was also around engagement in the left. And then my third point would just be directing you to a study that PEN America, a report that PEN America put out last week or the week before called Cracks in the Facade. And what, it does, what this report does is to outline the pushback and the cracks that we've seen in the agenda, the, the kind of regressive agenda in Florida and what has happened since the Don't Say Gay parental rights and education law was, uh, was adopted a couple of years ago. And the massive, and let me tell you, I read a bunch of these bills, really regressive bills that were, were, um, were put forward in this last legislative period. In Florida, the good news or the bad news is that their legislature only meets for eight weeks every year. So, so somehow that's good um, in that they don't have a lot of time. But, but some of the worst pieces of legislation that we thought, because they have a Republican supermajority in Florida, both houses of their legislature plus 
their governor are all Republicans. They were willing to ram through the parental rights and education law, the don't say gay law. So we were like, what's gonna happen now? Many of the worst pieces were not adopted because citizens mobilized, because people mobilized against them. There is power to do that, but only if the structures are still in place so that we can play fairly. When those structures are, are gamed, right, then the playing field shifts. And that's part of what we're seeing, but we're not there 100% yet, but it's something to stay very aware of and to learn the systems to fight back. That's what's happening on the school board level, right? These folks are really savvy about all the different mechanisms about how you play the school board. Um, and, and I'll say, I'm not, you know, I've learned a lot, but I'm not. Um, and, and it's our job to learn the processes, the procedures, and how to actually engage. Um, is it like a severe breach of protocol if I answer the same question twice? I just I I can't John, I'll I can't help you, myself. I, wasn't gonna um, I too was trained as a community organizer, and um, and there's tremendous value in in that I think. And um, with that being said, um, there's tremendous value in creating change through grassroots organizing. And I'm by default making a movie um, that hopefully will be coming out in a couple months, and we're calling it Amer American Agitator. And it's based on the story of Fred Ross, who trained me as an organizer. And he also mentored, not also, but mentored people like Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta and other people, and worked initially in the Dust Bowl camps in, in, in Southern California, and then worked in the Japanese internment, Japanese American internment camps, and then worked in the Central Valley of California. <laughs> and, and he created systemic change through organizing. It wasn't necessarily changing laws per se, but getting people together and having them vote. And so this film tells his story, but more importantly, it tells the story of all these people today who are standing on his shoulders and creating change through organizing. So I can't emphasize enough how important it is to, to convey to particularly young people who, who, and I'm on a panel tomorrow on TikTok, so if you want to hear me come <laughs> bloviate about that tomorrow, I'm happy to do so. But considering um, how many, many people um, put so much value on, on social media, uh, which, which, which can be very, very helpful in terms of organizing, but it can't be an, an excuse or a substitute for an, an, the actual um, process of, of you know, knocking on doors and, 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 and that grassroots organizing, which is, I think, the way to create that real systemic change that we need in this country and, and world. <clears throat> I'll just hop on there real quick. I also come from an organizing yes! background, right. perhaps a, a little more recently, but. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, no, I actually, it, it was in the, the I, I got my start in the 2008 Obama campaign, so. That's a lot more recently. <laughs> <laughs> but I actually worked with Marshall Gans and others who oh, had been nice. involved with, great, yeah, great, great. so. Um, but one thing I'll say is that one thing we know about polarization and sort of these um, kind of, you know, uh, the, the, the idea that, that the U.S. Is, and other countries are becoming increasingly more polarized is that people think that polarization is actually worse than it is. Yeah. So when we go about our day-to-day -day lives, interacting with people, organizing, knocking on doors, having conversations, we actually get along pretty well with people most of the time, and we have respect for each other, and we have interactions, and we have, um, you know, we have sort of warm feelings toward whomever. Um, but when we, re when we look at the news and we read what's going on, we start to get these, you know, more sort of um, uh, antagonistic types of attitudes and so forth. Um, so I just want to, to, to really emphasize this point about interacting with people and getting out there and being, you know, whether it's in a protest or knocking on doors or doing something, um, and not only doing this on social media where we tend to be surrounded by the people who only think like us. And I'd like to announce that Hadar is now running for school board in Montgomery County. <laughs> awesome. So to kind of take a little turn on the other side of the scope, um, there's a lot of questions asking, you know, like Trump's fascism, and we obviously see this across the globe with uh, Viktor Orban, uh, Brazil's leader Bolsonaro, and also in um, Bulgaria, not Bulgaria, yeah, Bulgaria. 
sorry, my Eastern Europe. Um, so Lukashenko is on, in Putin's pocket. Belarus. So a lot of Belarus, thank Belarus, you. Yeah. Um, so yeah. he's been asked, a lot of questions are asking is like, why do they want to do this? Why do authoritarian, like, authoritarian leaders want to kind of like, you know, take a turn against democracy? So I kind of phrase this into the question of like, what are the strategies we're seeing across these autocratic parties that are kind of, you know, leading people to the cause in the sense. So it's like, why are millions of people still following these leaders? And why are these leaders, you know, backing each other up across, you know, the globe? We see this rise. Um, obviously, we still see the grassroots location, where, as we just discussed, of like people pushing back against this. But we're still seeing large populations go going towards the mass of authoritarian leaders. That was coming to you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, there's. It, do you know? Do you remember that skit? It's good to be the king. No, nobody no. remembers that. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> It was funny so, in my mind. Well, <laughs> Do you want to go ahead? Go. Well, if you want to consistently give us hope, maybe you should follow me because <laughs> I'm gonna I'm on the fear <laughs> side of the equation. Uh, so. <laughs> I think it sort of progressively goes this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I I think there's a, a couple. Let's talk about the mass base for for authoritarianism. I mean. I, again, I'm not an expert on this, so I can just tell you what I think, what I, what I observe here. I, I think over the last 30 to 40 years, globalization has been a remarkable success. It has created historically unparalleled amounts of wealth in the world. The problem is that that wealth has not been evenly distributed. It's been siphoned off to, yes, the 1%. So there's a whole lot of people in this country and around the world who have been left behind, whose, standard, whose living standards are falling, not rising, and they are pissed. And their democratic governments have not delivered for them. There's a real problem here, it's economic. And so when, they are, when they, an authoritarian leader presents himself as the answer, whether it's a Modi or an Orban or a Trump, they want the alternative. They don't want what hasn't been working for them they want something else and they think they will get it. So that's one, that's the mass base. I think there's a racist base to this, that one of the things, one of the experiences in the world and in this country is the di diversity of the population. You know, this is no, I, I, th I don't think we're a majority white country anymore. If not, we're close to not being a majority white country. And that is very unsettling to people on multiple levels in multiple ways. It's unsettling to people that there's so many women now with power. What the hell is that all about? I mean, you know, we have a candidate someplace, a governor for North Carolina, who, who's uh, the Republican candidate for North Carolina, who, who doesn't believe women should have the right to vote. You, so this, this is deeply unsettling to a sector of the population, and they want an authoritarian leader, preferably a white male authoritarian leader, to correct this problem. And then you get to the capitalist class, which is all about money. It's all about continuing to, to suck out as much money as possible from their enterprises. And you see the way we've, uh, our industries have been reorganized over the last 30 years to move from a stakeholder base where, I don't, I don't know about you, but I grew up in a town where the owner of the local factory lived a few blocks from where I lived. And my family did not own much of anything. I went to school with his son. We don't live in that country anymore. There's this huge gulf that's created, and part of it is, is the, the, the industry itself has moved from stakeholders, where the, the industry, the, the business, had a stake in the community, had a stake in the workers, labor unions were strong. We don't live in that world anymore. We live in a shareholder world, popularized in the 1980s by Jack Welch when he took over the greatest company then in America, General Electric, and sucked it dry. So the industry collapses, the business collapses, but the shareholders get rich, and they want to keep that going. And you can't keep that going in a democracy. You need to impose your will on the people to, um, to, to prevent labor unions from challenging you, to prevent environmental regulation. They don't want to take forever chemicals out of the water. That will suck up their profits. They want to get rid of these regulations that are in standing between them and even greater wealth. And it's hard for us to understand how people with that much money can want even more. And we might think that's a, that's a disease, that's a mental illness. But there were a thousand billionaires in this country, as President Biden pointed out in the State of the Union. 
and a whole bunch of them don't care about anything else except maintaining and growing their wealth. Well said. Hope? No. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to give a, I, I, well, sort of, you know, sort kind of. of sort, kind I'm, gonna, sort I'm of. very comfortable in this fear side of the equation. <laughs> yeah. so I usually am the voice of doom, so I'm so happy to have somebody even this worse is, than I am. This is highly <laughs> unusual. You know? Is that right? That, it's highly that unusual. Hadar's the optimist here. Okay. Here's the optimism, right? Most people don't want that. Yes. Right? We've seen the popular vote in this country. And we've seen the popular vote not lead to the president actually being reflective of the popular vote. We know most people in this country don't want the autocrats. But what do we do about that, right? Because again, the rules and the structures in our country that are supposed to protect against that are being changed as we're not watching. Voters are being disenfranchised all through the South, but not only through the South also in very targeted electoral vote states, right? The right to protest is being diminished and is being shrunk. I think Plowshares did a lot of, no, yeah? Did you do right, um, to, right to protest stuff? No. No, never mind, somebody else did. Um, <laughs> lots of other people have. But, but the right to protest is being constrained in preparation for November, right? The, um, the impact, we haven't said the words disinformation yet in this panel, but we should not underestimate the way that there is targeted disinformation that is encouraging people not to go out and vote, that is focused on, um, on our young people. And I will say, I was speaking to a, a real authority on both disinformation and kind of the spread of um, the ways that, that the technology platforms are kind of spreading information and news um, uh, a few weeks ago, and she said to me, the, you, sh you know, just as George Floyd was used as a wedge issue and so much disinformation was spread and targeted in certain communities um, in, in 2020, you should be watching the spread of disinformation about the Israel-Hamas war now because that is being effectively used to disenfranchise and to, to uh, demobilize young people in particular. That's not to say that young people are not very, very upset about what's happening. Everybody is and should be on a whole variety of different levels. But the way that disinformation is being used to target and to de-democratize um, our, our systems, I think is really important to also notice. Um, like Rachel said, one of the first biggest indicators is around constraint of freedom of expression and the ways in, that, in, which, that's, in the, which that's happening. So it's disinformation, it's also the elimination, not just the, the shrinking, but the elimination of local news outlets in this country. Where people, again, going back full circle to our conversation about how local action is so important to organizing and feeling political success, when you don't have information about what's happening in your community, then you don't know that you need to do something about it, or you don't see what's really going on. So all of this is linked together. Um, the, I think that was a good voice of doom kind of thing. <laughs> um, and the upside is to demand and support your local journalism outlets, including student journalists, to, to engage and know what's happening in your community, to watch and to push back against, as they have effectively done in Florida, against some of the most regressive legislation that is happening, also on the state level, also on the national level, but on the local level as well, um, and to question everything that you get across your newsfeed, because even things that you think might be legit might really not be, and so question what sources are coming, and and to eliminate the clicktivism, click to, click, what, I can never say it, clicktivism, right? Liking something on social media is not the same as sending an email to your friend saying, there is this crazy school board candidate in Montgomery <laughs> County, Maryland. Yeah, it's about being a discerning um, consumer. 
and being consumer of democracy. Yeah, but also, and in terms of, and the, the only way that you're going to have a thriving democracy is by having a thriving press. And um, you know, I was the director of a part of the U.S. Holocaust Museum called the Committee on Conscience. When Elie Wiesel created the, the museum, he said a museum unresponsive to the future would violate the memory of the past. So he created the Committee on Conscience to focus on contemporary genocide. And my, 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 my title was the Director of Genocide Prevention. You know, it's like, okay, thank you. Um, how are you going to evaluate me this year? Um, <laughs> But a tall task, but nevertheless, we developed these early warning signs that we've seen over and over and over again. And certainly, the use of propaganda is, is, is huge. Um, and, and that's what, and we have so many more effective tools to convey that propaganda today, propaganda and misinformation. So I think it's so important to be that, that knowledgeable, discerning consumer of, of democracy, but also, you know, what, what leads to, to the, to the destruction of. <clears throat> Come on, upside. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know how well I can do the Hopi Changey thing on this one. Um, so I, I guess I'll just say, you know, in terms of, well, thinking about the US or Hungary or, you know, any of the, the countries. Poland, where, talk about Poland. Uh, Poland's not the one I know about. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I mean, I think in, in many ways, uh, you know, the, we've always had undemocratic institutions, right? We've always had the Electoral College. We've always had the Senate, which, you know, gives completely uneven representation to, to the population. Um, we've always had our, you know, Supreme Court come out of the Senate, which is, you know, the sort of uh, fruit of the undemocratic tree, so to speak. Um, so in some ways, you know, I think the, you know, the, the institutional story maybe hasn't changed as much as we're th we think it's changed. What's changed is the rise of these leaders who have been able to amass support. And I, I completely agree with, you know, the, the changes at the systemic level in terms of the concentration of economic power, um, you know, sort of the, 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 glo the rapid globalization of capitalism and, and how that's played out, the technological changes which have given aspiring autocratic leaders more tools with which to um, pursue their autocratic agendas. And then um, the geopolitical changes as well, which I think Joe mentioned at the very beginning of the panel, um, give leaders, uh, you know, supporters across the world, you know, give aspiring autocratic leaders uh, the opportunity to ally with other leaders who can support them in their autocratic agendas. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, these global level changes are very difficult to address in some ways. Um, but I think it does speak to the importance of sort of renewing our international institutions um, and investing in, you know, new, new structures that can, to some extent, address these system level changes that are uh, empowering autocratic leaders uh, nationally and locally. Can I just add, I want to give you, a, I, I want to give you an upside. I want to give you Great. positive, right? Yes. So, so Rachel mentioned Senegal, right? The, the strong arm leader of Senegal who came in as a Democrat, um, decided to delay the elections over and over again. The people mobilized, they pushed back, there was an election, the leader was overturned and they conceded power. Remember that part, right? Mm. Very important. Now in Poland, just recently, Poland had an eight-year regime that was governed by the Law and Justice Party, which was an Orban-ish, like they consulted with Orban. It was the same story, very anti-LGBTQ, which seems to be a recurring theme in these autocratic governments and which we see very much happening here as well. Um, and they, uh, uh, and women's rights were constrained. There was an almost complete ban on abortion in, or there was a complete ban of, uh, on abortion, I think, in Poland. And so it was right after right after right that was being taken back um, in this very regressive government. Um, they were voted out of power last year. Voted out of power and a democratic, rules abiding, internationalist, pro-West party came into power just the other day they nominated an openly gay minister into their government, which after this eight years is, is like wonderfully mind-blowing to see. 
right? Now, did the war in Ukraine have something to do with it? Probably, right? Because Poland has actually been a great refuge for Ukrainian refugees. Um, but that pulled people closer to the West again. They also saw kind of what was happening in Ukraine. But the people took it back in their hands and they voted out this autocratic government and reclaimed core values of democracy, Western values, and inclusiveness. And so I want to give you that, at least. Give you that and Senegal as a couple of examples of where it is possible. And so despite the fact that we do see democratic backsliding in a lot of places and in a lot of different ways, right? Democracy is not perfect. We have to reevaluate our social contract in a whole variety of different ways globally. Um, and it's this year, this year of democracy or this year of election, it's not a year of democracy, it's a year of elections, where a lot of that's playing out. But we should be looking at what happened in Poland and looking in some other places as well to know that it's not impossible. And I'm glad we recorded this so that I can have a record of me being the hopeful one. <laughs> <laughs> so we have about four minutes left. So we all kind of touched, you know, who's doom and gloom, who's more hopeful. Um, so you all will have about 30 seconds or so just to kind of give your last statement on after this discussion. Do you still feel like your same perspective that it's more doom and gloom or with the upcoming elections and, you know, knowing that people have the power at the bottom to change, you know, the results? In, in the hopeful matter, manner, what what do you see and hope for, or you know, how do you see the demise? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Exactly. Joe, start with doom and gloom. I, <laughs> I I would say that fear is what should motivate us, and hope is what should guide us. That this is serious, folks. We're not kidding around here. This is not some political sloganeering. This is a this is a phenomenon that's unfolding in front of us. And, and it, we, we have time. We have time to read the history. We can read the reviews of, of Timothy Ryback's book on the final rise of Hitler to understand the thinking of the people that put him in power, how they thought they could control him. And look at it now with these eyes and see. How the, uh, and the hope is that was what we see, that in election after election in this country over the last five, six years, the forces of good have prevailed over the forces of darkness. Even in a, 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 a Democrat just won an election in deep red Alabama mm -hmm. on the abortion issue over freedom of choice. And it's that kind of, of, of example that you got us, that we can do this. There's nothing inevitable about the rise of authoritarianism, that we, we're in trouble, we're in deep, deep trouble but we can defeat this and we can make our democracy stronger than it's ever been. Yeah, thank you, well said. Um, I mean, everything I'm, I'm, I'll say is to repeat everything that's already been set up here, but um, I, I um, uh, what was I gonna say? Um, I was just, I just had a thought. Hadar, should we skip to you until I? Yes. Yeah, um, it's just because you want to hear what I have to say no, first. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. was, then you can I comment on what she said. No, it was about Hesitant. democratic backsliding and. Oh, Pope, damn. Okay. Pope, Pope, right? I might interrupt you when it comes to me. Is that okay? <laughs> For a change. For a change. Oh, a man interrupting a woman. I have no problem with that. Go right ahead. For a change. For a change. Oh, I know. Okay, I got it. Thank you. So. So, you know, you always hear about history repeating itself, and we were talking about, you know, 1933 Germany or, or, or you know, 1990 Bosnia or 1993 uh, Rwanda, for God's sake. And, and it's not inevitable. But, you know, when you're talking about, about sort of the role of, 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 of um, business, uh, you know, a, exacerbating a lot of these democratic threats, um, you think about what was happening in this country in the 1930s and early 40s in terms of the rise of fascism, and you think about the role that Henry Ford played, you think about the role that, that Charles Lindbergh played, our national hero, there was no greater hero than, 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 than Charles Lindbergh, who was a Nazi anti-Semitic pig. Um, and and, and, and you, you think of the role of Philip Johnson, and Rachel Maddow, I don't know if you read this book she just wrote called Pre Prequel, and it talks about the rise of fascism. That was quashed, right? Um, that did not, and I don't know what the answer is, 
but it shows you that it can be done. And I think for me, you need to have, you know, you need to have these stories that, that give us, that give us hope writ large. <laughs> Thank you. All right, you guys got each like 20 seconds each. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> Just one quick thing. We need a Republican party. We need yes. a Republican party that is not captured by these autocrats. Mm -hmm. And so we've talked a lot about the Republican party. I wanna like, both because I come from a nonpartisan organization and because I believe that these issues are nonpartisan fundamentally. I want to make sure that we, we all agree that there needs to be an, a, a, a Republican Party that believes in democracy. I think the last thing that I would say is I have a lot of hope because all of you are going to leave this room and you're going to talk to your children, your grandchildren, um, your neighbors, and all of the people around you about the things that you can do and the steps that you can take, not through social media, but actually in person. Those postcards are important, but talking to your neighbors are even more important. And I'm very optimistic because Joe and I are, gonna con are going to together defeat the school board candidate in Montgomery <laughs> County, Maryland. <laughs> oh, it's hard to follow that, but um, I just want to very briefly, uh, there was this wonderful obituary of Alexei Navalny in The Economist, um, and it uh, oh, described yeah. Navalny's strategy against Putin as, as not having any fear and that the reason why he was able to be so successful in um, attracting support and, and threatening Putin um, is because he went about everything just without any fear whatsoever. So I'll just leave that with the final words of, let's not be scared of this, let's just go out and do it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Thank you.